Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new series exclusive to the History Hit YouTube channel where we're going to be hitting the replay button on some of the best known battles from history. That's right, we're going to be using the brilliant Total War gaming series to recreate some of the most famous battles throughout history, blow for blow, and taking you right to the heart of the action. And what an absolute whopper of a first episode we have to kick the series off. Yeah, today, October the 14th, we're going to be taking you back to the Battle of Hastings. This battle completely transformed English society. It paved the way for the Norman Conquest, swept away centuries of Anglo-Saxon rule, and of course, it's the reason everyone remembers the year 1066. And so for this video, I'm going to be taking you through the strategy of Harold Godwinson, the recently and rightfully crowned ruler of England. He was literally handed the crown by Edward the Confessor on his deathbed. At least that's the story I'm going to stick to. Yeah, a likely story. And I'm going to be taking you through the tactics and strategy of Duke William of Normandy, also promised the crown by Edward the Confessor and by Harold himself just a few years before this battle took place. See, what Louis has said there is a perfect example of medieval fake news. It never happened, mate. Get over it. It did happen. The Bayer Tapestry says it happened. Oh. And I've brought a massive invasion force across the channel to prove that I'm in the right. But I guess we'll have to settle this one on the battlefield. It's looking that way, isn't it? Uh, anyway, if you want to find out more about the context of the battle, say the Viking invasion that preceded it, or indeed the aftermath of Hastings, then go sign up to History Hit TV, where we have loads of documentaries, interviews, and podcasts on this very subject. Yeah, and if you sign up today, you'll get 30 days access for free. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel as well. But right now, it looks like the two armies are assembling behind us. So let's get into this battle. Okay, so for Harold, this invasion really couldn't have come at a worse time. He's just had to see off a Viking invasion uh, led by Harald Hadrada, the King of Norway, and of course his exiled brother Tostig. And that came as a surprise in itself. So Duke William's invasion is even more of a nasty surprise. He now has to march his army all the way back down south to Hastings, which is over 250 miles. Yeah, William's been waiting pretty much since early summer for the winds to change so that he can cross the channel with his army. Uh, he manages to do this eventually on the 28th of September, and when he lands, he probably can't believe his luck because Harold is nowhere to be seen. So what he does is he sets up camp, starts ravaging the south coast, building fortifications, and basically goading Harold into a fight. Yeah, and it seems what Harold wanted to do is he, he wanted to take the Normans by surprise. This was a, a tactic and strategy he utilised against the Viking uh, invasion at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. It worked very well for him, so it's not a bad strategy. But what it means is it means he cannot allow his army to replenish to its full strength. Uh, he sacrifices size and strength uh, for speed and surprise, and it's something that a lot of chroniclers would end up criticising him for. Yeah, schoolboy error, basically. Um, <laughs> William's reconnaissance is really good. The plan doesn't work out anyway because his scouts see Harold coming down from London. And it ends up being William who marches out to face the Saxons. And basically, the night before the battle on the 13th, William keeps his troops awake. He doesn't want this surprise attack to sort of overrun his men. They wake up on the 14th, strike camp, and the first time they actually see the Saxon army is on this ridge, uh, seven miles at north of Hastings, blocking his road to London. Okay, so to illustrate this battle, we're using the video game Total War Thrones of Britannia, which is a fantastic game sort of set in the Anglo-Saxon period, but it is a game. It's not a kind of expert-led simulator. So it's gonna give us a real good sense of Hastings, but it's not gonna be 100% accurate. Yeah, of course, it's impossible to recreate every single move made by the armies uh, on the day, uh, especially as our sources don't agree on the details. So what we're showing you here is essentially based on balancing that evidence uh, with what we do know already about warfare in the 11th century. Okay, so first of all, let's look at the Normans. So their army is divided into three main sections or battles with William in the centre with his Norman troops, his allies, the Bretons, on the left flank and the men from France and Flanders on the right flank. And the way they're set up is they've got the archers in the front rank, behind them the infantry, and in reserve the elite cavalry force. And it's quite interesting, the Normans are descended from Viking raiders who traditionally fight on foot, but they've really kind of 
adapted to this European mainland style of fighting on horseback and they brought two to three thousand horsemen with them and that's going to be a real advantage over the English. Yeah, Harold's army very different uh, to the Duke of Normandy's. He's only got infantry men, so there's no archers, or perhaps one archer as we were <laughs> later going to discuss, uh, and no cavalry uh, whatsoever. But what he does have is he has position. He has position right at the top of Senlac Hill, a very steep uh, incline. So he has that. Um, the ridge was actually too narrow uh, for the Anglo-Saxons to even deploy their full force, so he has some troops in reserve. But alas, the main strength of the English army is, of course, their famous shield wall. This interlocking barrier of shields protecting the whole width of their line. And uh, Harold placing himself just uh, uh, beyond that, uh, surrounded by his household troops, the Huskars, uh, and the rest of his army made up of lighter armed levy troops. So one thing that the sources do agree on is that William himself starts this battle by moving his archers up Senlac Hill to test out the Saxon shield wall. It seems that William had plenty of archers at his disposal, but maybe a few thousand, including some mercenary crossbowmen there mentioned in the sources, whereas the English didn't have many, if any, at all. I mean, is this really the best you've got? I mean, as you can see, the, the Norman archers are barely leaving a scratch on the Anglo-Saxon shield wall, which was a technique that they utilised after centuries of fighting toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, with the Viking invasion forces. And as you can see from this, it's clearly left Duke William completely at a loss. I don't think so. I, I, I just tend to think that the shield wall is a bit of an old-fashioned tactic. And Duke William's barely got started yet. So what he's going to do now is move his infantry up this hill to attack your lines. And remember, this might be a steep incline, but he's got professional well-trained forces. You've just got the local English peasantry. Uh, okay, listen, Harold is relying, admittedly, uh, on the local feared and militia to hold their ground, but judging by the bio-tapestry, it looks like the core troops of both armies were pretty evenly matched. I mean, the, the Anglo-Saxons, they've got their two-handed axemen, they've got their pikemen, uh, you know, the Huskars have, are very heavily armoured with their chainmail, the famous, of course, kite-shaped shields, and I'll tell you what, a farmer with a pitchfork can do some damage against some cavalrymen, I'm telling you. Um, and of course, how could I forget the Olympic-like javelin throws uh, in the ranks of the Anglo-Saxon army, which are absolutely pelting, as you can see, uh, the Norman army as we speak. So as these two lines clash for the first time, we get to see what the two armies are made of. There's no Hollywood charge where both armies disintegrate into each other. This kind of fighting was all about staying in a densely packed formation, fighting as a unit. And once William realises that his infantry aren't going to simply steamroll their way through the Saxon lines, he would have sent his cavalry up the hill to probe the shield wall as well. Yeah, and despite this pounding from the Normans, it did seem uh, like Harold's plan was working. The shield wall was not budging one bit. His Huskars and his militiamen, uh, they were proving a match for William's cavalrymen. And this is astonishing if you think about it. You know, these troops have never faced uh, men on horseback before. And of course, your forces and your troops, they're still fighting uphill. So they're going to be absolutely knackered by this point. Yeah, they're getting tired. Your guys are doing okay, to be honest. Um, after about an hour or so, William decides to pull back his cavalry from this kind of melee fighting. And it's this withdrawal that actually leads to one of the best known incidents of the battle. So at some point during the morning's fighting, the Bretons on William's left flank start going into a headlong retreat. We're not sure why this happens, but it could actually be because a rumour starts spreading through the Norman forces that Duke William himself has been killed. Now, of course, what the Anglo-Saxons needed to do at this point is just stay where they are, hold formation. You know, you don't have to fix what isn't broken, but that's not what happens. Uh, as you can see, a huge section of the right flank start chasing, smelling blood. They start chasing the Normans all the way down the hill, and this is disastrous. We don't know who gave the order. We don't know if it was given in the first place. Uh, we do have a source uh, from the 12th century that says that Harold ordered his troops to maintain formation at, at all costs. Uh, so you can imagine he's not too pleased at the moment. 
No, probably not. But William's got a crisis on his hands as well. He's got a huge part of his army retreating. So what he does at great personal risk is he takes off his helmet and starts riding through the ranks of his army. And this is basically to show his face, to show that he's still alive, to lift the spirits of his men. And as he's riding across the battlefield, he spots a golden opportunity. He realises that he can use his cavalry to surround these English pursuers and cut them down. Yeah, and these uh, uh, brave and you could say slightly ignorant troops are now surrounded on all sides. They, they really have uh, nowhere else to go. Surrounded, they are completely annihilated. And the bio tapestry actually shows that Harold's brothers, uh, Gierth and Leofwin, uh, were killed at this point in the battle. So it is possible that they were the ones uh, responsible for leading the charge down the hill. But, of course, we can't be for certain. We don't. So early in the afternoon, there was probably a lull in the fighting, a break for lunch basically, as this battle still had a long way to run. And William probably used this time to develop a new strategy. He'd seen that a sudden withdrawal of his troops had actually lured the English out of their shield wall so they could be attacked more easily. And this feigned retreat tactic is something that he probably thought he could use again using his cavalry. You can call it feigned retreat all you want. I think it was just the Normans running away scared and petrified as usual. Uh, anyway, uh, the uh, Harold obviously has his own problems as well. Uh, his Huskars are getting whittled down by the Norman cavalrymen, uh, so he's probably using this time just to shore up his line as best he can. Yeah, and after lunch, William's plan starts to play out. So he sends his cavalry to probe the shield wall again, using their lances, their swords, to hack away at the defenders and try and draw them out. We can't be sure exactly what the commanders are thinking at this stage of the battle, but the sources do offer some interesting comments. So William of Poitiers, for example, who's Duke William's chaplain, not actually at the battle, but a very good source, he says that the feigned retreat was used twice by William, and that William himself, who must have been leading these charges, had three horses killed underneath him. Yeah, no, obviously what we do know at this point is that the English line didn't break completely. Uh, but what William's strategy does do is it draws more and more troops out into the middle of the battlefield. That's where William wants to fight this battle. And of course, if it's true that Harold's brothers had died at this point uh, and other senior commanders, you can understand that discipline and maintaining discipline along the line would have been, been a very difficult task at this point. Um, and the bio tapestry kind of confirms this uh, when it shows the battlefield being a mess of confusion and carnage with bodies literally chaos. littered everywhere. Chaos. So late in the day, William probably senses that he's got a chance to finish the Saxons off. The last thing that he wants to happen is for night to fall and King Harold to slip away. In fact, Harold's death is so crucial to his plan to conquer England that he probably puts a strategy in place at this time specifically to go in and kill him. Yeah, and it's not exactly as if Harold made it very difficult for William. Uh, you know, lesser men might have got on their horse and ridden away, but not Harold. You know, he stays until the very last, despite his shield wall being disfigured and his strategy effectively in tatters. But as we know, it didn't work out too well for him. No. So our sources agree that Harold did die late in the battle, probably around this point where the Normans are punching holes in the Saxon shield wall, getting round behind them. But how he died is a mystery. We're not sure if he died through an arrow in the eye, or whether it was Norman knights coming in and hacking him down, or whether it was simply in the press of battle and no one really knows. Yes, the bio tapestry isn't all that clear in that it shows two figures under the line about Harold being killed. Now this part of the tapestry was actually heavily restored in the earlier centuries and sketches uh, of the tapestry after it was found in the 1700s don't include anything about an arrow anywhere, so who knows? Yeah, it's a bit of a mystery. So the arrow in the eye story first appears in the sort of medieval sources in the 1080s. An Italian monk recording the Norman conquest mentions that this happens. But the most closely contemporary source, a, a poem called the Carmen written to celebrate the conquest, says that Harold was killed by a group of Norman knights led by William himself, a kind of death squad. Now, Either way, we do know that Harold died on the battlefield and that it proved to be decisive. The Battle of Hastings after his death turned into a rout.
Okay, I get it, Harold's dead, the army's in tatters and everything's awful, but the spirit of the English, it lives on, right? Well, no. Sorry, mate. Uh, the Normans go about overhauling English society from the top down, starting with the nobility, the legal system, the architecture, the language. Talk about salt in the wound. Uh, anyway, I think I'm just about done with the Battle of Hastings. What battle are we going to recreate in the next video? Yeah, so next on October the 25th, we are going to be seeing if the English fare any better against the French at the Battle of Agincourt. Ooh, something tells me I might get redemption in that battle. Yeah, you might do. Join us then, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you won't miss any of our upcoming videos. And of course, if there are any other battles you'd like to see us recreate, let us know down in the comments below. Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel, which we are relaunching. We've got all the best exclusive content going straight onto this History Hit YouTube channel. And you can find out, for example, why on earth I'm standing at the top of this mast. You should probably subscribe.